Caper Live. I know it's been a very long time since I did this and way behind, so far behind, but as if any of y'all are on my page, you know what's going on. So I wanted to go ahead and try to finish Colossians 4. They're already in 2 Samuel and way into it, and I'm not even trying to keep up with that. I just wanted to cover Colossians because it's such an excellent book. But so I didn't do verses 5 and 6, and then the next one was 7 through 18, or 7 to the end of the chapter. Uh, so I'm going to try to just, like, go through it and not, you know, get off topic, and, and hopefully just go ahead and finish it with in, without it being too, too, too long. So, Father, as we get into your word, I just pray that, that the Spirit move and speak through me to open our eyes to see and our ears to hear what the Spirit has to say through your word, to hear the message that you're saying, to let it, let it soak in us so that we can share it with others, so that we can be the salt and light of the air, of the air, oh, I'm sorry, I just had a thing pop up, <laughs> salt and light of the earth, as Jesus called us to be. And Father, we always ask, as always, when we get in your word, we ask that you help us to grow in our knowledge and wisdom, discernment and understanding. We thank you, Father, that we can so boldly come before your throne of grace and, and speak to you directly. We thank you for that. We thank you that we have your word and, and the Holy Spirit as a comforter and a guide. And I pray, Father, that when we get up each morning that we remember to thank you for waking us up and to ask you what it is we can do for you and for your kingdom to bring glory to you and your name. And we pray this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Okay, so, Colossians 5 and 6. So as we get into the word, Colossians chapter 4, verses 5 and 6, the Apostle Paul, still by the Holy Spirit, of course, is writing, and he says, verse 5, be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation, verse 6, I'm sorry, verse 6, <laughs> be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. Um, Let's talk today about how we as God's people treat other people, especially those who are not believers. And the reason why is because here in these two verses, Paul is exhorting us concerning the paramount importance of how we act toward others. So as I usually do, okay, I did not, I didn't, uh, I guess I didn't go through this. Okay, let me see, let me just get past this. Okay, so I, I swear I remember doing this, but I'm just going to do it anyway. Who's crying? Of course, you're going to start bugging me now, Pepper. But he said he, he says that the Lord was would have him to take the approach of posing a series of questions. Girl, your belly is so full, you're going to pop. My goodness. Here, you go down there and you feel like a sea tick, man. I boiled some chicken thighs today and fed it to the babies, and she just hasn't stopped eating. She's just so full. My goodness, girl. Sorry. Anyway, so so what follows are five questions within these two verses that every one of us will do well to answer. And, and so starting with the first question, I swear I've done this video, but I can't find it anywhere. In the first part of verse 5, it says, am I wise in the way that I interact with those who are not Christians? See, what I find interesting is that right after Paul, in the previous verses, asked for prayer very specifically, for prayer that God would give him boldness, that God would open up doors for the gospel, that right after he asked for specific prayer about winning non-believers to Christ. That he would now talk about walking in wisdom toward non-believers in order to win them to Christ. It's like he's saying, not only should we be praying that God opens up doors for us with the unbeliever, but when he does, we need to be wise toward the unbeliever. There are two questions that I believe every non-Christian is asking. The first question they're asking is, is it real? Perhaps better asked, are you for real? Maybe even better asked, are you the real deal? And the second question they're asking is, does the Christian life work? And by the way, they want the Christian life to work, and they want you to be the real deal. Do you realize 
that they're reading the letter of your life. They're watching you as a Christian and how you live your life. That's what the Apostle Paul says to the Corinthians in this in his second epistle, the third chapter, verse two. He says, Yourselves are our letter written on our hearts, known and read by everyone. The non believer is watching you all the time. They're seeing how you react under stress, how you treat other people, and oh, by the way, isn't that what Jesus himself would have to say? That the way the non-believer is going to know that we are his disciples, his followers, is by our love one for another. In other words, how we treat one another, well, this sort of dovetails into the second question in the second part of verse 5. And it's, do I make the most of every opportunity and redeem the time important to understand that this word, redeem, carries with it the idea of having value, just like you would redeem a coupon or something of value. And what Paul is saying is time is valuable. Redeem it. Make the most of every opportunity that the Lord presents to you. Now keep in mind, he's writing this letter from prison in a dungeon of a prison, and he himself is taking advantage of that opportunity. While he's there, to me, Paul knows what every one of us should know, and it's that God will set up these divine appointments in order that we might seize the moment. We have to first recognize it. You know, when it comes to time, it's the great equalizer. It is not. Is it not we all have the same exact amount of time? That's not the question. The question is what do we do with our time? Do we waste our time? I have to confess that this is an area in my life where the Lord has really been dealing with me lately now this is debbie talking lately i've been spending more time watching crap on youtube instead of my studies like i usually do i've really really been drifting away from what i usually stay focused on and it's because i've just been feeling so bad so sick and i just haven't felt led to study and read and all this you know and, and that's exactly what satan was wanting to do is exactly what he was counting on to happen you know was i would get you know, he would get me so downtrodden and so sick that i would stop doing what i was doing because evidently i am a threat to him which i praise god for that so when it finally dawned on my dumb butt that, that i'm giving satan the victory that's when I realized, uh, sick or not, I need to be about the Father's business. There's not enough time left to be sitting on my butt, you know. Uh, there's just no time at all because time is almost up. Israel, just IDF just got attacked by Egypt. They're getting attacked all the way around. Everyone has started to turn their back on Israel, and all of this is depicted. Uh, Zechariah 12, prophecy, look it up. Jeremiah 49. Come on, people. It's literally unfolding right before our eyes, and it's just any time Jesus is going to come for his church. I'm just telling you, because the time for the Antichrist to come on the world scene is so now to bring peace, an answer for peace, and, and an answer for all the poverty, I mean, not poverty, the uh, famines everywhere, and and he's going to be able to call fire down from the sky and, and probably put an end to all this devastating weather, you know, because he is the prince of the air, right? So, just you know, be aware, be awake. Make sure you have plenty of oil and trim your wick and keep your oils lit, uh, oil, lamp lit and plenty of oil. I'm just saying, don't let him come as a thief in the night. But I digress. But anyways, I've been open with you as a, as a church, you know, or as whatever, but with my struggles, when it comes, to, okay, okay, he's talking about his thing, and he's talking about traffic, it's just, Miss Ma'am, no ma'am, we don't do that. She's on the back of my chair, and then she's going to dig her claws in my back as she climbs down. Oh, she's finally getting to play with the little baby, she gets a little rough, but she doesn't make them cry but she wraps up around them to where they can't actually move, so they don't really get to play back, but it's cute. But sometimes Bella has to smack her in the head a couple times to bring her back to reality. But anyways, let me get past this where he's talking about, uh, let's see, 
Okay, I'm just going to read what he says, okay? He's talking about, he's, you know, he's been open with his church, with his struggles when it comes to traffic. He says God speaks to him a lot in traffic, and the problem is that is that it's in those times that we don't recognize that maybe this is an opportunity for someone to, or for, for him. One commentator noted, you see it there on the screen, this is interesting, I actually don't like statistics like this, but that they're very disturbing, but the average American spends six months of their life waiting in a red light. That's valuable time that I can spend talking with God. Spend that time in prayer. Make the most of every opportunity that God presents you. Redeem that time. That's, that's time that you can redeem. It's valuable time. Use it wisely. That's what Paul is saying. He echoes this in his epistle to the Ephesians in chapter 5. Really expounds, Bella, do not slap the baby really expounds on it more so in verses 15 through 17 he says be very careful then how you live not as unwise but as wise making the most of every opportunity and here's why because the days are evil there's not much left not much time left we should be found faithful in taking advantage of every opportunity that we have that God gives us in the short amount of time that we have it goes on to say in verse 17 Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. In other words, it's the Lord's will that we redeem the time that we live wisely. That we are very careful and make the most of every opportunity. Here's the next question. Question number three. Three, first part of verse six. Do I err on the side of an abundance of grace? I'll explain why I asked that question that way. Paul says that our words need to be with grace. Our words need to be gracious. We need to have grace and be gracious, especially when we are interacting with the non-Christian. One of the things that I'm learning in my walk with the Lord, that it's not so much what I say or do, it's how I say it and how I, I do it. Like I can say the right thing in the wrong way. We need to, we need to, if we're gonna err, we need to err on the side of an ambient abundance of grace. I have never regretted being gracious. Conversely, I have any regrets when I should have shown more grace. Well, here's question number four. And I want to spend a little bit of time on this one. Because it's really interesting. The question is, this: does my conversation with others bring comfort and encouragement? Here Paul refers to our words not only being gracious, but also being seasoned with salt, which in that culture meant so much more than it does for us today. The value of salt in that day was such that some were actually paid with salt, which is where we get that saying, they're worth their salt, because that was how it was. That's how, in, in the Roman Empire, that's how they were paid with salt. It carried that much value. You know, our English word salary comes from the Latin word solarium sal. It is the Latin word for salt. So what's Paul saying here? Our words season with salt well. What he's saying is that our conversation should have the same effect. Same effect. Same behind me. Same effect that salt has. What all of us all do well. Salt preserves, salt adds flavor, salt creates thirst, and perhaps more importantly, salt can be a healing agent. That's what Paul's saying here, salt keeps the rottenness away it's a preserving agent salt adds flavor salt should and always does create this thirst and when we're talking with people especially the non-christian our conversation should have a flavorful salty effect not salty in the negative sense that totally came out wrong you get the point but even more so our words should have the effect of bringing healing and comfort and encouragement when we're talking with people Oh, honey. Uh, it should have this edifying effect. When we're talking about the Lord, it should never be boring. It should be full of flavor, full of joy. I think it is. And this might come off maybe a little bit strong. I hope you don't misunderstand me when I say this. But I, I think it's a shame when a teacher of God's word is dry. There's no flavor. Just the word of God is so exciting. And I think it is just sad when there's no flavor that is there. It's just bland and boring and talk with non-believers. And we don't have that flavor, that salt, that joy, that excitement, that passion. 
and they look at our lives and we might say something to them like, you wouldn't want to go to church with me, would you? <laughs> no, right? That presupposes that you're even going to ask them. Reminds me of a true story because years ago on, he's talking, he's telling the story, on the mainland, guy shares about how that every weekend his neighbor would say, hey, you want to go golfing with me? And he said, nah, I'm, I'm going, I got to go to church. Wow, you, you got to go to church? Really? Yeah. So you keep asking them and figured one of these days, maybe he'll go golfing with them. And then finally on this one weekend, he says, hey, you want to go golfing with me? He says, nah, I got to go to church. True story. You know what the guy said? You know, he said, you know, I've been inviting you all this time to go golfing with me. You have never once invited me to go to church with you. Oh, how convicting is that? You know what it should be like? There should be such a peculiar thirst creating joy in our Christian lives that our, that, that neighbor comes over and invites himself to your church. Yeah, hey, I hear you go to that church in Bethany. I think you get the point. But when we speak, our words should not only be gracious, full of grace, but there also has to be some salt. You know, sometimes salt can also sting a little bit. Yeah. But it's a healing property. And sometimes we as Christians, I think we miss many opportunities that the Lord presents to us. Okay, well, let's move on because I'm really convicted now. This is the fifth and final question. And it's in the third part of verse six. And it's a biggie, by the way. The question is, am I able to give an answer of the hope that I have? If you were to ask me what I thought was one of the main reasons that many Christians don't share their faith, this would have to be it. There's this fear that I don't know what to say, or but what if they ask me a question and I don't know how to answer? I mean, you know, that's sad. You know what's sad? And I don't know what to... I'm fully capable of doing this. I don't want to be derogatory and start bashing on the church in general in America, but I do lay blame on, with the pulpits in the United States today because they don't teach the word. So now what you have are illiterate Christians. Who don't know the Bible. They don't know how to give an answer. Apologetics is what they need to study. To even and, and these are intelligent questions, you know, God has given us an intellect. He has given uh, we have this God given intellect and it's sad to me that Christians as a whole are so biblically illiterate. And I have to say this too. I was stunned by a statistic. I had heard a while back about how many Christians have never read the entire Bible. And again, please, I hear my heart on this. I don't mean to you, no, you know, to get in your face on this, but you, you're being robbed. You, you don't like, you don't want to have anything stolen from you. Do you? Well, you're being robbed of the riches that lay within the pages of God's Word. So know the Word of God. That as it's been said, if we were cut, we would bleed. Bible. Yeah. If a mosquito, I want to be so full of the word that if a, if a mosquito bites me, he will fly away singing there's power in the blood. Amen. I want to be the kind of Christian that when I speak, it would be as the oracles of God. That I would speak into the life of another, the word of God, an encouraging word and be a blessing to that person and give them that answer that they're seeking. What is the answer that they're seeking? They're asking for and seeking for hope. And we have that answer. We have that hope. First Peter, and I'll close. Chapter 3, verses 15 and 16. This is, again, echoing what the Apostle Paul is writing. He expounds even more. Listen to what he says in your hearts. Revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. So he says, do it with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. When Paul writes to the Corinthians, he says we are able to comfort others with the comfort we ourselves were on the receiving end of from God when we were going through the same thing that they're going through. But when we do, but but we do, we ha but when we do, we have to be able to give them an answer. 
so that they too can have the hope that we have. And when they look at our lives, do they see hope? Do they see that, wow, they're different, that they're different the way they're handling this and they're going through this and I'm going through this and I'm watching them, but they have hope. I don't have hope. I want that hope. We have to be at the ready to give that answer to everyone of that hope that we have. They act towards others, especially those who are not believers. They're always at the ready to give an answer of the hope that they have. And Father, I just thank you for that word today. That was a very encouraging message that was taught by Pastor J.D. Farag. And I truly hope anyone that listened to this, or if they just went and watched the link and watched Chip teach it, either way, it's awesome. Uh, I hope that it speaks to their heart as it did mine. I'm going to go ahead and end. Let's see where we're we at in time. Okay. 20 minutes? Awesomeness. Okay, so let's just go ahead and keep going. And let's go ahead and knock out the rest uh, of the chapter and be done with Colossians 4. We can finish with Colossians, actually. So, Colossians 4, 7 through 18 says, The problem with Christian superstars. So, Colossians chapter 4, verses 7 through 18. The Apostle Paul now brings his letter to a close in a most interesting way. And by way of full disclosure, I'm probably going to butcher and boss his names. Now, this is J.D. Farrar saying that, and I asked Debbie saying it too, as I try to pronounce them. And now keep in mind, he's from Lebanon, all right? He's Lebanese, but I guess, I don't know if he speaks anything, I don't know if he speaks any other language, so I don't know if he speaks Arabic or not, so I guess Arabic wouldn't matter if you're trying to pronounce a Hebrew name, right? Or a Greek word or something. Anyway. Um, so, so we'll try our best anyway with these names. So in verse 7, Tychicus, sounds like a disease, I know, but Tychicus, or Tychicus, sorry, Tychicus, will tell you all the news about me. He is a dear brother and a faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord. I'm sending him, verse 8, to you for the express purpose that you may know about our circumstance and that he may encourage your hearts. He is coming with Onesimus, Onesimus, Onesimus <laughs> our faithful and dear brother, who is one of you. In other words, he was a local boy, a local Colossae boy. They will tell you everything that is happening here. My fellow prisoner, Aristarchus, I forgot to look that word up, Arist Aristarchus, yeah. sends you his greetings, as does Mark, the cousin of Barnabas. You have received instructions about him. If he comes to you, welcome him. Jesus, verse 11, who is called Justice, also sends greetings. Hold on, let me put the baby down. Come on, Mama. Put the Please don't bounce right back out of the bed. Okay. Jesus, verse 11, who is called Justice, also sends greetings. These are the only Jews among my co-workers for the kingdom of God, and they have proved a comfort to me. This is the Apostle Paul that is writing. Verse 12, Epaphras, who is one of you and a servant of Christ Jesus, sends greetings. He is always wrestling in prayer for you, that you may stand firm in all the will of God, mature and fully assured, I vouch for him that he is working hard for you. And for those at Laodicea, Hierapolis, our dear friend, Luke the doctor, and Demos, send greetings, give my greetings to the brothers and sisters at Laodicea and to Nympha and the church in her house after this letter has been read to you. See that it is also read in the church of the Laodiceans and that you are, and that you in turn, oh baby, I just switch out one baby for another one that wants to be in my lap now. Oh, jeez. Tell Archippus to see to it that you complete the ministry you have received in the Lord. I, Paul, verse 18, write this greeting in my own hand. Remember my chains. Grace be with you. So I think if we're honest with ourselves, we would have to admit that 
but probably to skip over passages like the one that we just read, right? I'd venture to say that there's probably not a one of us. Oh, okay, hold on. Come here, little one, then there's, um, there's not a one of us that has any one of these verses as a life verse, right? <laughs> and even if we do read it again, let's be honest, we don't really tend to get out or get much out of it. I mean, after all, it's just a list of names. It's kind of the end of the credits. Look at baby mama. It's the end of the letter and it comes to a close. This is kind of like, you know, how it is when the movie ends and then all the credits, you know, the scroll at the end. And I have yet to see anybody sitting there with their eyes glued to the screen eating popcorn during the credits. Wow, looking at all those lists of names. But here's the thing. God deemed it necessary to inspire the Apostle Paul by the Holy Spirit to record the names of all of these people in this letter for a reason. 2 Timothy 3, verses 16 and 17, Paul writes and says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God. Okay, I am going to have to actually come right back and restart this to do the second part like in about 10 minutes i just realized i forgot to do something and i gotta go take care of it before james goes to sleep <sighs> okay i'll be right back guys i'm sorry i forgot about it Thanks.